could I could I can I ask you about a, a little bit about about insight? How you get how you move from data to insight? Here's a here's a, another one of these sort of metacognitive problems. You know what what is insight? Um, perhaps you've got a, a, be, a much better definition than me. I, I like to think of it as being this kind of profound and useful understanding. It's profound because it answers the not the trivial, but the the entry level question of what do the data mean? So what? And allows us to go on and do rather more interesting things and say now what? What shall we do as a result? Um, if you have a much better definition, please tell me. Um, but uh, what I'd like to know is how you go, how you get to 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 insight, how you get in your papers, in your books, to move from we've looked at this, this is what we they seem to be showing, and therefore this is what we conclude as a result. Yeah, so I, 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 I agree with your definition of insight. And as a cognitive psychologist, the puzzle is, how does it actually work? What's going on in the, in the brain that, that gives us these strokes of insight? I, you know, I don't like to believe in magic. I don't like to believe that we've got some kind of spirit or soul that has an uncanny ability to, 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 to see true things. I mean, that's just too mystical. So something is happening that's mechanistic. I think there, um, uh, and there's been research in, classic artificial intelligence, uh, as well as massive neural networks uh, that address that. One source, it may not be the only one, but I think it's a very important one, is analogy. Um, and this is one that I, I talk about in my book, The Stuff of Thought. And here I rely on, in part, on the work of the cognitive psychologist Dedry Gintner um, and, and philosophers like um, uh, uh, Robert Boyd. The um, an awful lot of scientific insights came from analogies, um, not superficial metaphors that this reminds you of that, but rather that the kind of the flow chart, the logic diagram, the deep underlying laws can be ported from some domain that we're familiar with to some new domain that we're grasping, we're, we're grappling to understand. So you know, the, uh, some of the obvious examples are um, the solar system is a model for the atom in the work of Niels Bohr. Um, the, uh, a, a, a code, uh, a linguistic code as a model for the um, heredity in uh, Watson and Crick. Um, the uh, flow of water as a, down a waterfall as a analogy for the transfer of heat in thermodynamics. Um, billiard balls in, in terms of um, uh, statistical mechanics and thermodynamics, that heat is a bunch of uh, billiard balls um, bouncing faster and faster. The thing about them and the, what makes it a challenge is you can't just think of, about any old something it reminds you of because there's a lot of pseudoscience that relies on uh, superficial analogy like powdered rhinoceros horn is a cure for erectile dysfunction because, you know, it's, you know, long and pointy and something else is long and pointy, therefore one treats the other. You know, that's not the way to do it. And there's nothing in particular that is perceptually similar between a, you know, say a telegram and a stretch of DNA or an atom in a solar system. It's rather the underlying forces and interactions in the case of, uh, say, the solar system, it's centripetal force and attraction and momentum. In the case of DNA and, say, a telegram, it's redundancy and information content and um, stop and start signals. It's an abstract level in which you could actually say um, not just that two things are similar, that they remind you of one another, although that's probably the start, but that at some level of abstraction, they're actually the same. That is, you could talk about centripetal systems, an atom being an example, a solar system being an example, a tether ball being an example, and that at that level of abstraction, they really work the same way. The explanation is the same. And the reason that this is, I find, appealing, or in the case of, say, uh, se selection, uh, there's natural selection, there's artificial selection, what you know, pigeon fanciers do. There may be selection among uh, ideas. There's um, uh, artificial evolution in computer systems. But that in all cases, you can talk about random variation, selection, multiple generations of copying. They really are the same at some deep level. 
the reason that I, I find this kind of a promising way of thinking about insight, and, and, and this whole conversation really does get back to your question, I promise. Because uh, the thing about insight is it can't, the puzzle that we have to solve, and the reason that I think you, you brought it up is that insight can't consist of any old random association. You know, this makes me think of that. Well, big deal. Anything can make you think about anything. The, the challenge in understanding insight is why are the ideas good ideas? Any ideas good ideas? Why when you go eureka or the light bulb goes off, does it really solve the problem as opposed to just lead you in some random chain of associations? If there are, and I promise to wrap up, if, if there are these underlying systems like a centripetal system, uh, selection by consequences, information codes that underlie reality in different superficial manifestations, then one of them really can give you the answer about another, give you insight into the other, assuming they both legitimately are two examples of the same underlying system. <laughs>